We turn um, now to the yellow ladybugs. You can see on the screen in yellow is Katie Coolis, who is the founder and CEO of Yellow Ladybugs. Katie has uh, made her oath and affirmations before coming on screen, and so too has Nikita, and we'll hear from Nikita in a moment. So Katie, I've introduced you, and you're going to give us some um, opening remarks. Please proceed with your opening statement. Thank you, and I would like to thank the Disability Royal Commission for the opportunity to talk today on the experiences of autistic girls, women and gender diverse individuals with a particular focus on family, domestic and sexual violence. So thank you. So um, Mandela says, education is the most powerful weapon which we can use to change the world. And today I really do hope we can educate everyone listening through our stories. Stories that are sadly not particularly remarkable because they happen far too often. And by that, we hope we can start beginning to create change for our community. So Yellow Ladybugs is an autistic led non-government charity with a strong mission to create opportunities for connection, learning and promotion of autistic pride for autistic girls, women and gender diverse individuals. We also have a really strong advocacy mission to address the many challenges, barriers and disadvantages we face, which is why today is so important. We are often the overlooked minority within the minority, within the minority. And we have so many cross intersectional layers of disadvantage, including LGBTQIA+, BIPOC, homelessness, poverty and violence. We are invisible as our disability is largely hidden. Being autistic and female gender diverse carries with it so many risks. A significant and known vulnerability for our community is being taken advantage of in relationships, often due to our own adaption of social skills, our often high ability to mask. It's sadly no surprise that as a result of this, we find our community is at much higher risk than the general population of experiencing abusive relationships. There are many complex layers to these stories and we are here today to give our community the voice and attention they deserve. Compounding this is living in a world not designed for us. We are the neuro minority. So often the expectation is that we must learn to fit in, change who we are, mask our identity, act normal. This societal expectation is often reinforced by the intensive compliance-based therapy some autistic children receive in their early years, which goes on to have such an impact on how they experience the world as adults. It is generally known as ABA. This is the type of therapy that emphasizes compliance. And in doing so, it reduces the ability of autistic people to trust themselves. Compliance training akin to grooming is a gateway to being manipulated by adults to do as they tell you without question. It is safe to say that there is no corner of this Royal Commission where the specific vulnerabilities of autistic girls, women and gender diverse individuals, or I guess it could be called our community, are not an important part of the conversation. But today we will talk about some of the protective measures we think will help reduce our community's vulnerability to experiencing such violence. So I think it might be worth spending a bit of time to revisit what Yellow Ladybugs means to our community and why we came about. Because by building a strong autistic network where we help each other better understand our identity, where we connect with our peers and we promote and develop pride, we believe that's an important area we need to focus on. We believe it's a shining example of a user-led organisation stepping up when the system has failed us for generations. And the importance of that system investing in user-led organisations such as Yellow Ladybugs. It is dangerous to be an autistic woman who does not have access to her community, who feels alone, misunderstood, shamed and not worthy. I want to share a quote that illustrates this point perfectly. He beat the shit out of me and nobody stopped him. 
I didn't report him to the police and I didn't take myself to hospital and I should have, but I didn't because that's all I thought I was worth. That's what happens when you soak one child in shame and give permission to another to hate. That quote is from Hannah Gadsby, a yellow ladybug's ambassador and autistic woman. Worth, it's such a powerful word. So let me tell you a little bit more about the yellow ladybug story and how it connects to worth. I remember back to the first event we ever held. I created this event together with my six-year-old daughter just so she could meet other kids like her, girls who were autistic. They were hard to find. She had already be, been begun questioning her self-worth, feeling isolated and alone. And so she asked me to help her. Our first event, we had 20 autistic girls come along, some traveling as far as three hours away. That's how desperate they were to find their peers. And when I saw the parents watching their little ladybugs, all in their yellow t-shirts, wearing it with pride, playing and laughing together, I saw the parents have tears streaming down their face. I knew this was our calling. I knew we could make a real difference. And what I saw was the beginning of autistic pride, a beginning of belonging, a beginning of community, a safe place, an opportunity to educate against the many vulnerabilities and disadvantages they unfortunately most likely would face. And therefore I began to see the beginning of change. Since then, we have hosted thousands of ladybugs at events. We've evolved to online events so we can reach every corner of Australia. And in the process, we've uncovered the most difficult stories we've heard. Autistic women and autistic gender and diverse adults who have experienced such disadvantage. And this has helped us evolve our mission and widen our reach and our impact. We've also educated the very people that should already know, but doctors, teachers and professionals on what autism so often looks like in gender diverse and autistic females. We have provided a platform for education and we've amplified autistic voices. What this story doesn't highlight is how grossly unprepared the system is at recognising the diverse presentation of autism within our community. My family, as well as thousands more, have experienced a disproportionate number of barriers to getting a diagnosis for autistic females and gender diverse individuals. And this is important, and it does link to the risk of violence, because if you don't know who you are, you don't know how to protect yourself. Currently, there are no official consensus around the ratios, but I will say that one in four autism diagnoses in Australia is female but a growing body of research and strong anecdotal evidence suggests the actual prevalence rates to be closer to one-to-one. -one. In fact, a recent study pushed the ratio at four to three and notes that 80% of females remain undiagnosed at the age of 18. We have been overlooked for many reasons, including prevailing stereotypes of what autism looks like, the gender bias of standard diagnostic tools, and the way girls are socialized and viewed in our society. More generally, we know that many autistic females and girls and gender diverse individuals are missed or having their needs invalidated because of their hidden presentation. So why is this important? Well, the impact of this oversight extends beyond access to diagnosis and exposes so many layers to vulnerabilities including economic disadvantage, inequality in healthcare, especially in the realm of mental health, restricted access to education and limited access to communities and their peers. Importantly for today, it exposes the specific vulnerabilities our community face in relation to violence in all its forms. There are so many more factors that contribute to our particular vulnerability. Grace Tame says, Perpetrators typically target children with added vulnerabilities. These include tenuous family circumstances, mental illness, self-esteem issues, prior trauma and isolation. In Grace's case, she was 15, anorexic, and we now know she was an undiagnosed autistic female. What we know from our community is that we find it difficult to identify when abuse is occurring. 
We may experience difficulty reading people's intentions. We have communication differences, which put us at a disadvantage. We have limited access to, to peers. So getting advice is hard. When reporting, it can be difficult for those of us with alexithymia as we struggle to identify how we are feeling. We may have executive functioning challenges. So the logistics of navigating an already difficult reporting system is overwhelming. One of our members says, I'm a 33 year old autistic woman who has faced violence in many forms throughout my life. Going through the process and getting involved in reporting was overwhelming for me. Even going to the police to report family violence is bad, let alone going to court, which is not set up at all to support my needs as an autistic woman. As I've said today, Yellow Ladybugs is committed to changing the system. And, the and we decided to have a survey to better understand our community. And this, the responses confirm just how broken the system is and how autistic girls and gender diverse individuals are currently being failed. Reading through the responses broke my heart. It made me sad, but it really did make me mad. We have to do better. So like I said, at the start of the year, we did put out a survey. We asked questions about domestic, family and sexual violence. The structure of the survey was a mix of qualitative and quantitative responses. I must admit, we didn't have a lot of time to promote it, but we did get 235 responses, which I think think shows how important this is to our community. I will not have a chance to go through all the observations today. I will table that in our report, which lays out a very bleak future for our community unless things change. Our survey results did confirm that our community experience a particular set of vulnerabilities that put them at a risk of becoming victims of violence and abuse. We are typically undiagnosed and late diagnosed, as I, said, as I said, and have a lifetime experience of low self-esteem. And that's where we see people think there's something wrong with them. 75% of our respondents have experienced physical violence. 76% of our survey respondents have experienced sexual violence. And 95% of our respondents with physical or sexual violence was from someone we knew, someone we trusted. We know these results are not alone and there's many more studies that paint a similar picture. In one overseas study, researchers found that autistic women had nearly three times the odds of having experienced sexual abuse compared to non-autistic women. While these statistics are shocking, it is the personal story shared by our survey respondents that deliver an even more powerful message. We have drawn on these stories in the recommendations we have developed. This was one quote, autistic females need to be validated and recognized and supported to live an authentic, meaningful life. While our identity continues to not exist in the eyes of society, we continue to degrade and bury all of who we are. We become so empty and confused and traumatized that most of the time we don't even recognize if we are being mistreated by someone. Even if we do recognize the violence, we usually believe we're overacting because we've been told our entire lives to suck it up and stop being so sensitive. You can also see there's another quote on screen from another member, but there are so many ones similar to this. And that's what I mean about the overwhelming, consistent message that is coming across from our community. I'm going to finish up now um, this part of the conversation and head over to our case study. Thank, thank you, Katie. It's um, Kate Eastman here. I think commissioners will now uh, ask Nikita. Nikita's prepared some words that she'd like to share with you. And um, you may not see Nikita on the screen, but you'll hear from her. So Nikita, when you're ready, there's no rush. When the man enters the room, the girl looks up with a curious smile. Though if she knew his intentions, she would have run a country mile. He crosses the room, a strange look on his face, like a starved carnivore spotting some steak. It's true her short life had been far from ideal, but nothing could prepare her for the coming ordeal. The man snatches up the girl and stares at, tears at her clothes, hard hands bruising soft, untouched flesh. 
Insistent moist lips press into her face while stale breath and whiskey leave her senses a mess. Her cry of fear is cut off with a blow. The ground rushes up. She lets out a moan. In confusion, she looks up at the one she should trust, but all she could see was his treacherous lust. The tears of the innocent stay in the ground and her world becomes black as he covers her like a burial shroud. This is my earliest memory, being sexually assaulted around age four. Luckily, I dissociated for most of it a clever trick our brain does to allow us to survive the unthinkable. I completely shut down afterwards and when I was unable to tell anyone what happened. I do remember getting in trouble for destroying all of my dolls. The man had called me a pretty little doll and I knew they weren't safe, so I cut off all of their hair and drew all over them with black markers. My parents are good people, but they had no, no idea what to do with their strange first child. I met none of my mum's expectations of what a daughter should be. I remember, remember being punished for things that I didn't understand, being forced to wear clothes that set off all of my sensory, sensory sensitivities, being smacked in my sleep for grinding my teeth, being made to feel like whatever I did was not good, that I was never good enough, no matter what I, sorry, sorry. being made to feel like I was never good enough, no matter how hard I tried to make them happy. When I was around 10 years old, my dad's charismatic best friend assaulted me. He'd always been nice to me and gave me positive attention, something I severely lacked. So I thought nothing of it when he took me to the back of his property in the dead of night. There he raped me. After he finished with me, he made it very clear that it was all my fault and that my parents would be very upset at me if they ever found out what I did. I had no, no one to turn to, so I suffered in silence. When I was 13, I was groomed by my 30 year old sporting coach. I was very lonely at the time, didn't fit in at home and was bullied at school. He knew just how to take advantage of that. The relationship lasted until I was 17 and followed a typical narcissistic abuse cycle. The abuse I faced became more intense and degrading over time, but I struggled to leave and had no one to turn to for help. Unfortunately, stories like mine are all too common amongst the autistic community. It's no wonder that so-called high-functioning autistic women are 13 more times likely to commit suicide than the general population. Years of abuse, neglect, and having to mask constantly to be deemed socially acceptable takes a large toll. At the age 17 and a half, I finally broke away from my long-term abuser and went on to have a seemingly successful life to those on the outside. But the truth is, I've only had one other intimate relationship since that time, and that too was abusive. Other than that, I have emotionally separated myself from the world, all in the name of self-preservation. I bounce between perfectionistic overachieving to not being able to achieve the most basic of life skills. I trust no one apart from my children and my very patient therapist, or most of the time. I'm very good at what I do professionally, but I have faced discrimination and bullying in the workforce on numerous occasions. Currently, I work with a very good team that is completely accepting of me and my quirks, but often that is not the case. I have resorted to substance abuse and other unhealthy coping mechanisms throughout my teens and a lot of my adulthood. My past traumas affect my ability to be the mother I want for my wonderful children. They are awesome, but sometimes trigger my trauma responses, leading me to react in ways that they don't deserve. I'm currently working hard to heal from my past traumas and learn how to cope more healthily as an autistic adult in your typical world. It's a long, slow and often painful process, especially given my inability to trust people. I would like to think things have gotten better for people like me since I was a child, but I hear too many from too many of my autistic peers that are still being mistreated. Personally, I have had to fight every step of the way to get my own autistic children's needs met, particularly in the education system. In year seven, our public school repeatedly threatened to keep my daughter out of the academic extension program due to her, due to her inability to meet their minimum 90% attendance rule. This was despite her maintaining a B average, them knowing her diagnosis and us getting letters of support regarding her anxiety from multiple medical practitioners. At the end of the day, we managed to keep her in the program, but the process almost broke me. In the last month alone, I've heard too many stories that make me want to rage and weep. A friend whose autistic daughter is so overwhelmed by the system, she has resorted to giving herself third degree burns with aerosol spray. 
and despite that her parents are still unable to find adequate medical or psychological help for their child. Another child was left mute for days, suffering from sunburn and heat stroke after being left in the, lying in the sun at school all day. They'd shut down after being screamed at by the EA employed to help them. Things must get better. Too many people are being hurt and neglected all for the crime of being neurodiverse. The string of letters I've accumulated after my name aren't the type that are admired by our society, but I'm still a person with rights, needs and dreams. Nikita Williams, ASD, ADHD, CPTSD, human being. Thank you. Nikita, thank you very much for sharing your poem, sharing your experiences. We know this has been very difficult and we greatly appreciate you having the courage to share with us. Thank you. You've also got some recommendations that you want to make and the commissioners will have the opportunity to read the recommendations. Thank you, Nikita. And for anyone listening, I'll put up on the screen our content warnings and the telephone numbers. If anyone see, wishes to seek assistance or speak to somebody, the numbers are available on the screen. Thank you again, Nikita. Katie, I think we're coming back to you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Nikita um, may stay on and listen in the background so commissioners you'll have an opportunity to thank both Katie and Nikita shortly. So Katie as you know uh, we've seen the results of the survey which shows some quite startling statistics in relation to the experience of women and girls living with autism and their what they report in the survey of both physical abuse but also sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. The survey has been important in uh, the work that you do to advocate for uh, people living with autism, and particularly experience of girls. Can I ask you about the importance of the advocacy work that you're doing? Do you want to talk about that topic now? Yeah, thank you. Um... Thank you so much for that. Yes, and thank you, Nikita, for sharing your story. It was I'm very grateful um, to all the autistic individuals who have contributed to that submission, and it was very um, powerful, so thank you. The advocacy work we are doing covers the lifespan of our community, and as we dig deeper, it is getting more and more evident that it's generational trauma that we are seeing because of so many unmade needs unmet needs amongst our community. We have, like I said earlier, layers of vulnerability, but also a minority within a minority and a minority. And it's really taking the impact and it's formed some of the recommendations we have got for you today, which I'd like to talk to um, about this particular in inquiry. Do you, do you want to speak to those recommendations now? Yeah, I've got three recommendations I'd like to bring up and the rest we will table. Thank you. So the first recommendation um, we've got is that we do need to see a commitment to fund, develop and deliver a wide range of preventative education programs and resources for our community, specifically as a protective measure against our particular vulnerability to family, domestic and sexual violence. These programs need to be co-designed by the autistic community throughout every phase of their development and their delivery. And programs need to be covering topics such as safety, consent, healthy boundaries, re healthy relationships, coercive control, understanding the different types of abuse. And I do have one of our survey respondents that gave a quote on this topic saying, Given we are vulnerable in the first place, preventative safety education is paramount. And given we are often not identified as children, it is important to offer this education to our community and make it autistic friendly. So more education and support helping our community recognize toxic relationships, give them the support they need to leave toxic situations is critical. 
Our second recommendation, again, is preventative, but I know I spoke from the heart when I talked about yellow ladybugs and what it means um, to help us feel worthy and recognise our autistic identity, but we think that we need to fund peer support programs and events that enable social connections for autistic girls, women and gender diverse individuals. We identify this as a key protective measure, reducing their experiences of isolation and loneliness and the vulnerabilities to abuse that come with these experiences. And again, I've got another quote um, from one of our um, respondents saying, going to a Yellow Ladybugs event has been a lifesaver, literally. I did not want my daughter to experience the same lonely, isolated life I did as an autistic woman. She has developed friendships, a sense of pride in her autistic identity. And this is the biggest protective factor, I believe, which can cancel out all those vulnerabilities she may have experienced down the road. And the third recommendation um, we've got is further research combining lived and professional experience is needed to understand any link or risk between compliance-based autism therapies, including ABA, which can set autistic children up for a future of manipulation, exploitation and abuse. And this is a quote from the Therapist Neurodiversity Collective. The purpose of pairing is for the ABA provider to associate, i.e. pair themselves with activities and objects that the child enjoys developing a relationship with them. The crucial difference between therapeutic rapport building and pairing is this. During pairing, the ABA provider uses their relationship with the child to later increase the child's willingness to comply with demands that they find aversive. Grooming and pairing essentially one and the same. Both processes are intended to develop a relationship that an adult then leverages to encourage a formerly unwilling participant to do something that they may not have originally felt comfortable consenting to. So that is I've taken from a third party source, um, but I do have another direct quote from an autistic woman who was a previous ABA therapist from, named inappropriate possum. ABA therapy has resulted in teens who comply with the demands of any authority figure. In short, we are allowing our children to mature into easy prey for predators by acquiring to their submission to a compliance reward structure that can be perverted and abused to harm them. We are so caught up in extinguishing behaviours in our offspring that we erase their ability to say no or defend themselves. This system of autism behavioural management doesn't teach recognising and avoiding predators, bullies and abusive people, and it has to change. So in conclusion, all the recommendations and protective measures in the world will not be effective unless society addresses the issue directly with the perpetrators. We are here today talking to the lived experience of autistic females and gender diverse people, but we cannot ignore that as Victoria's police, police assistant commissioner, Luke Cornelius has previously stated, violence against women is absolutely men's behavior. So we need to shift the narrative away from the focus on victims and ensure this is a justice in a system that sadly has many times in the past served in favor of male perpetrators. But let me first, let me finish up by bringing it back to our ladybugs. We, and for those listening at home, we do not deserve to be invisible anymore. We do not deserve to be overlooked. We do not deserve to be ashamed of who we are. We do not deserve to be isolated. So we urge you to listen. We urge you to make real, substantial, practical changes. Our lives might just depend on it. Thank you so much for listening today. And I'm available to answer any questions if you have them. Thank you, Katie. The commissioners may have some questions for you. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I shall start uh, with uh, Commissioner Mason. Do you have any questions you would like to put to Katie or any comments? Um, no, I don't have any questions, but I would like to thank you for the evidence that you've provided today, as well as Nikita. It's been uh, really excellent and um, wonderful that the voices of uh, women and girls has come through right through the evidence you gave today. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Commissioner Bennett, is there anything that you would like to ask? Um, I'd also like to say thank you, Katie, to you and Nikita, and particularly um, your ability to draw on your own experience and other women and girls and think about changes that need to be made and the suggestions that you've made to us. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner, Commissioner Gelbert. Yes, I'd like to add my thanks to Katie and Nikita and ask a quick question about peer support and how incredibly valuable and important it is, but also as protection um, against risk. And just wondered if you could expand on that. That was, uh, that was really important, I think. Thank you. Um, yeah, so... I, we heard in some of the stories that with people talking about their experiences, isolation and not having peers to get advice from or just generally feel like you've got a community around you is powerful. But then on top of that, when you're in a, in a world that's not designed for you, um, you do feel like you're the outcast, you're the odd one out, and it affects your worthiness. And as we heard in Hannah Gatsby's quote, even if you are then in a position of being abused, you might not feel, feel worthy enough to report it. So having that ability to connect with people that understand you and are like you is incredible because you start beginning to build pride, pride about who you are and know who your community is. We've seen it in other amazing um, revolutions such as the LGBTIQIA plus community and this is where the autistic community is, is really starting to recognise how important it is that we unite and we connect with each other and we know that we aren't the outcasts, we're just the minority and when you provide that, that social connection, you are protecting the future generations, I mean the current, but the future generations um, to empower them to know that they're worthy, to know that they're, they're different, they're not less. And this is what we need to do. We need to connect our community. And the fact is autistic, gender diverse and girls are particularly at risk of this because we're hidden and we're isolated and it's hard to find um, our peers. So this is why yellow ladybugs is so important because when I first found out my daughter was autistic, Everywhere I went, it was just autistic males and boys. And this is the point. We're creating a world where now we're connecting it and there's demand globally, but we just can't keep up. There is just this need out there and we, we deserve it. We deserve to feel connected and that will protect us and very important. So thanks for the question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Katie. And thank you also, Makita. Or uh, to both of you for the thought and care you put into your presentation. Uh, we know it's uh, not necessarily easy to do that in an environment such as this. And, uh, we very much appreciate uh, your contributions to the 